Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at OrganicUniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.TheOrganicView.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Dr. Dave Goulson, Professor of Bumblebee Ecology and Conservation at the University of Sussex, will talk about his new book, A Buzz in the Meadow. So I'd like to welcome back to the show, Professor Dave Goulson. Good afternoon, Professor Goulson. Good afternoon, Jean. Professor, could you please share a little bit about yourself for our listeners who are not familiar with your work and also some of your other work that you've published? Sure. So I'm a professor of biology at the University of Sussex, and I specialize in in studying bees, and particularly wild bees, uh, bumblebees in particular. I've been studying them for about 20 years and uh, published lots of scientific papers. And then more recently, I I published a book called A Sting in the Tail, which uh, which is all about bumblebees and their fascinating lives. And now I have a, a new book out, A Buzz in the Meadow, which comes out in the U.S. Uh, in uh, April, April the 28th. If your last book wasn't fantastic enough, this book, Buzz in the Meadow, is just brilliant. I really felt as a reader I was able to not only understand your compassion for other living beings, but also learn a lot about their behavior and why they're so necessary in our world. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for taking the time to write this. But I'm just curious, what inspired you to write A Buzz in the Meadow? Well, it seems to me that we just overlook the importance of of insects and also how interesting they are. So there are these little creatures, they live all around us. Uh, Most of them are only the size of your fingernail or smaller. They do all sorts of things, and and most of them we, we do not appreciate at all. And yet, if they weren't there we'd be in big trouble. So just, just a few examples. Flies and beetles that, that get rid of uh, animal dung and that help to break down uh, rotting organic matter. If it weren't for those little creatures, then the world would, would slowly fill up with, with animal dung, with cow pats and so on, um, which might seem silly, but actually it's really, really important. Uh, and, that, and that's just one example. Bees, of course, are, are one of the best known examples of Uh, how insects are important to us, they pollinate our crops. But actually, there are thousands of species of insects doing equally important things. They might not be quite as obvious, they don't have the profile that bees do. But nonetheless, they're there. Um, And then on on top of that, um, it isn't just about what they can do for us. These things are just really cool. Um, You know, they have these amazing, complicated lives, a lot of which you can just see if you take the time to get down on your hands and knees and and have a look in your backyard or the local park or whatever. Um, And there's there's loads of stuff that hasn't even been discovered yet. You know, that every day we find out new things about these creatures, and and there's plenty more to keep me occupied for the rest of my life. Um, So they're just really fascinating, really really cool, and they deserve uh, appreciation and, and more attention than they get. In the beginning, you write that insects fill almost every conceivable ecological niche. They can be predators, parasites, herbivores, or detritivores. I, I thought that this was a very interesting description. Having said that, do you think that insects will survive the existence of our species? Oh, with, without a shadow of a doubt. So it, insects have been around for about 350, 400 million years. So they, they were around long, long before the dinosaurs. Um, uh, they were amongst the first creatures on land, in, in fact. 
and th- there is absolutely no shred of a doubt that, that they will be here long after we're gone. Some of them, at least. Some of them are remarkably tough. But the sad thing, of course, is, is that some of them are not, and, and some of the more sensitive, delicate insects are disappearing right now. And, uh, you know, if we really would be wise to, to look after them a bit better. Uh, but others of them, um, I mean, famously, everyone talks about cockroaches will be a, will will out survive humans. Well, I'm damn sure they will, but it won't just be cockroaches. There are a lot of other insects. They're, they're remarkably adaptable uh, and tough creatures, many of them, and uh, they, they, they thrive despite uh, what what we've done to the world. And and many of them will will continue to do whatever we do and whatever happens to us. Many people believe that we are all connected. What do you hope readers will learn by reading A Buzz in the Meadow? I, I hope they'll realize not, not just that the natural world is, is really fascinating, um, but also that, that their life actually depends um, on, on, uh, on these little creatures, which might sound overly dramatic, but it, it really is true. They make the world go around. They, they perform all sorts of vital roles in ecosystems. It's so easy to forget. So, you know, when, when you, you buy your food from the, from the supermarket and it comes in a plastic wrapper, um, you, 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 take, you, don't, you just take it for granted. You, most people don't really stop to think about where food comes from. But, of course, you know, it, it's grown in a field somewhere. Uh, those roots are in soil that's being aerated by little creatures burrowing around. Uh, the, the, the crop roots are taking up nutrients that were released by other insects that broke down last year's crop that are they're releasing nitrogen into the soil and so on. Um, the bees that pollinated the crop. Um, in so many ways, we, we are, are dependent on um, the natural world, and particularly these little, little creatures that do these small jobs, small but vital jobs. Um, and, and so many people have forgotten that. We live in our artificial plastic world, um, and we've lost sight of, of our kind of roots, where we came from, and, and th- that, those fundamental links to nature, which are still there. We still have to eat. Food still has to come from somewhere. Um, and, and I just want to remind people of that and, and, uh, and, and make them just stop for at least for a second and pause and, and you know, recognize that we're just one creature on this planet and then we need to look after the rest of them too. The majority of the book focuses on Shea Nausch, which is this farm that you've been trying to renovate that's located in, in France. What were your intentions for creating this preserve and if you could take a moment, could you share some of the unexpected problems that occurred that actually hurt some of the beings on the land? So, so the, the idea was I, I've always I wanted to, to, I guess, have my own little patch that I could manage for nature. Um, you know, I've done a lot of research on, on bee declines in particular, and one of the things that, that bumblebees, uh, the, one of the reasons they've declined is that we've lost a lot of the flower-rich habitat that we used to have. Um, and so I, I, I really just loved the idea of having my own patch where I could grow wildflowers, where I could c- recreate a wildflower meadow, and not just for bees, but for all the other creatures that, that live in and around a, a meadow for beetles, grasshoppers, praying mantises, voles and shrews, skylarks, uh, endless creatures that, that have colonized this field. So it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a 33-acre meadow that was a, a, a cereal field 13 years ago uh, when, I, when I, I bought the place 12 years ago. And, uh, and I've been slowly turning that meadow back into, into a huge wildflower uh, uh, meadow and, and refuge for wildlife, basically. Um, it hasn't, hasn't all been plain sailing. Um, the, the, we've had a few disasters. I, I unfortunately, it, it, in renovating the house in the early days, the house is in a terrible state, the leaky roof, um, damp walls, rotting timbers. It's a very old stone and, and timber um, French farmhouse. And uh, I was demolishing a wall that was about to collapse anyway. It was full of all rotten timbers and it was all damp. What I hadn't realized was that there were these absolutely beautiful marbled newts 
that you wouldn't normally expect to find newts living in a house, but they were actually living in the in these damp walls, and some of them got got squashed in the process. Uh, but what was more disastrous was was that I we were we were removing rubble from the house in, as part of the sort of renovations, and I threw it all in a, a little hollow um, at the side of the drive of the house, um, just as a convenient place to get rid of all this rubble. What I hadn't realised, because in summer this little hollow was completely dry, um, when I came back early the next spring, I realised that actually in winter that little hollow fills up with water and it's where the newts were breeding until I idiotically filled it up with, with a whole load of rubble. Um, so it actually not only accidentally killed some of the poor adults, but, uh, but I removed the, the, their, their breeding place as well. So I have since re-excavated that pond, um, but sadly the newts are not yet back. I, I live in hope every year that they'll, they'll return. But other wildlife is doing brilliantly, and it's really, really rewarding to, to, to see it. You know the, this this field that was once a pretty much a, you know it was a blank canvas. There was no wildlife there at all, nothing. Um, and now it's teeming with with literally hundreds of species of wildflower. And I've I've had over 60 species of butterfly, which is about the same as have been recorded from the whole of the United Kingdom, uh, just in this one meadow in France. Um, so it's 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 a, it's a pretty wonderful, cool place to to go. Thank you. I just thought personally that. Someone with your vast knowledge, your education, the fact that you are not only a well-respected but also well-loved expert on bumblebees and so many other beings, that these were things that happened even though you had the best of intentions. And I think it's ironic that there are certain entities out there that profess to be doing something good when... And, and it's a perfect world that they're creating when it couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. So I just wanted to say thank you for being so honest and for explaining some of these things that happened. Because I think for many of us that are trying to do good things, this is something that can happen to any of us. But it's also a lesson for those that think that they are in complete control of everything that they're doing, that they couldn't be more wrong. Yeah, it's, it, it, sadly, it's all too easy to, to do things, well-meaning things that, that actually do more harm than, than good. And, and you know, a big part of the problem is we actually we don't know half as much as we think we know. Um, but humans are fantastically arrogant creatures in many ways, and um, we, we really don't understand the natural world terribly well. It's actually incredibly complicated, and that's part of its kind of great beauty is, you know, there are all these it, linkages between species that, that they're all connected together this, help, this meadow is a really nice example where you've got all these different creatures plants and animals that, that interact in different ways and we don't, we don't really understand it it's actually so complicated that I'm not sure we ever will fully understand it but you can do something you know, it, 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 that, that seems like a good idea to us at the time but actually turns out being uh, to be disastrous for, for, for something or other um, because we don't, we, we're not as clever as we think we are. I couldn't agree more. You describe in detail the fascinating mating process for dragonflies as well as the cannibalism that can occur with the mantis. You then go into detail about your observations while raising mantises. Is it mantises or man mantises? Man mantises, I would pronounce it. Mantises that you brought back from Gambia. What did you conclude? And my second part of the question is, what were the two distinct strategies of the males? <laughs> so so for, for a lot of insects, so generally speaking, female insects are bigger and stronger than male insects. So it's the other way around to, to, uh, in, in mammals and humans. And if it's a predatory insect, like a, 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 a praying mantis, um, that poses a real problem because if you're a male insect and you want to find and mate with a female, um, there's a distinct chance that she might just eat you. Um, so, so it's a pretty risky business courtship in in uh, in, in the praying mantis, um, and it is very common for for the male to to be consumed by the female, um, uh, and and there's a um, 
there's a theory been around for a long time that actually the male doesn't mind as long as he gets to mate first. <laughs> that he's essentially, he's, he, he mates with the female, he, he's passing on his genes to the next generation in, in fertilising her, and that if he then gives her a, a big meal as well of himself, then she'll be able to produce more eggs which his sperm will, will fertilise, and that that is, is, a, is therefore a good strategy for, for, for the male mantis to, 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 to mate and get eaten at the set shortly afterwards. Um, and in fact, they can. What's rather bizarre is they can do both at the same time. So, what often happens is the male does manage to, to mate with the female, um, but and she she will sit there for a, for a little while uh, as, as they copulate, and then um, she'll get restless and she'll turn around and grab the male who's much weaker than she is, and she'll start eating his head. Uh, while his, the rest of his body is still is still copulating, and s oddly enough, the, the the male's body actually becomes more enthusiastic at, at copulating once the head has been removed completely. Uh, it's all rather macabre. Anyway, so the theory is that the the, the males don't mind being eaten. It's 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 all part of their strategy. Um, and so I set I set out to test that uh, many. It's a good few years ago now, um, with some students at the University of Southampton, where I was at the time. And um, so what we did very largely was, was we watched an awful lot of, of matings between, we put males in cages with virgin females and looked to see what happened. Um, and it, it quickly became clear that, that, that the males were doing everything they could to avoid being eaten. It really wasn't, wasn't something that they, they ever kind of gave, willingly gave themselves up for. Um, but what was quite striking is they did have two different ways, different tactics. Um, so some males would get behind the female, creep up on her very, very slowly um, so that she didn't notice they were there, or at least that was what they seemed to hope. And then at the last second, um, they would they would charge forward and jump on her back and grab her. Uh, uh, staying on her back obviously keeps keeps them away from the, the powerful forelegs and the, and the mouth of the female, which is the dangerous bit. Um, uh, so some males would do that, and it seemed to work sometimes, not always. If they, if they got spotted by the female and she was more interested in food than sex, then they were in trouble. Um, but other males would have a completely different strategy, and this is in the same species. Other males would approach the female from, a, from the front uh, so that she couldn't miss them, and they'd do this really elaborate little sort of dance where they would wave backwards and forwards and they'd uh, wobble their abdomen up and down, and, uh, and, they'd, and they'd do all this in front of the female. And as obviously they were trying to impress her um, uh, that they were a desirable mate, and then having spent often... 10 minutes um, doing these rather bizarre uh, waggling dances. They would then try and essentially leap over the head of the female and kind of somersault in the air or back on, on, onto her back. Um, now, now, both of these strategies seems to work sometimes, but it's, it's, it's a pretty risky business. And um, in the region of 60% of the males, uh, uh, were consumed by their potential partners. Some of them managed to mate, but then got eaten. Um, others um, didn't even manage to mate, and they just got they just got wolfed down. Um, but when they did manage to mate, and those that didn't get eaten, so they'd finally finished mating. Th uh, once they'd finished, they would scarper as fast as they could. They ha they certainly didn't show any signs to me of wanting to be eaten. Um, so it's pretty pretty fascinating stuff you can you can see just by watching these 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 creatures. Um, presumably this has been going on. For, you know, it, it happens in a, in the meadow in France. It happens all over the world all the time. But people don't often take the time to watch, and it's really fascinating. I thought it was fascinating. I, I thought that was really interesting. I remember learning many years ago that the purpose of a plant is to reproduce, and I'm wondering if that is also true with the whole world of insects. Well, of course, the, the essentially, um, in, a, in an evolutionary sense at least, um, the, the purpose of an individual is, is to to produce as many copies of itself as it can. That, that's what determines kind of evolutionary success. So the individuals that leave more offspring um, become more common in the population and whatever traits they had spread. Um, 
and and so and and it's I guess what's different about insects and some plants, particularly annual plants, is they don't live long. You know, an, an adult insect, in some instances, ha has just a few hours to to, to mate and 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 produce those offspring before it dies. You, more typically, it may be a few weeks, um, but it's it's really not long compared to our lives. So most adult insects they're really preoccupied with 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 finding a mate and with producing eggs because they don't have long to do it and and that really is 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 their function the other things in life like growing they're done by the the, the you know the feeding and growing part is done by the immature stages so, so let, if say with the butterfly um the caterpillar is the growing phase caterpillars aren't interested in in finding a mate or having sex or anything like that that's not what they do uh, they just grow uh, the adult insect is 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 all about finding a mate, producing offspring, and finding as many mates as possible, producing as many eggs as possible. Um, so, so I guess it looks to us from the outside as if adult insects are perhaps somewhat obsessed with sex, but that that's their job. That's what they're that's what they're for, in a sense. When it comes to Musca domestica, why are they necessary, and are they vexatious? Uh, so I, I am so often asked this question: Why, why do we need flies, Musca domestica, the house fly, um, or why do we need slugs, or why do we need yellow jackets, and so on? Um, and there are a number of answers. I mean, it actually, for, with many, the Musca domestica, the house fly, they actually, although they are vexatious, they are damned annoying. They, they are the most frustrating, persistent creatures. They will land on you over and over again. So there are lots of them. They'll, they'll, they can drive you insane. Um, and in warmer parts of the world, there often are lots of them. They also spread diseases. They, they love to feed on our food, but they also love to feed on all manner of unpleasant things that I won't go into. So they spread bacteria around and many diseases and so on. But they also do, do useful things. Um, we wouldn't have swallows if we didn't have flies for them to eat. Um, there are many creatures that rely on flies as one of their main food sources. Um, they break down dung, um, so um, that the larvae of the housefly specialise in eating the, the, primarily the, the dung of herbivorous animals like cows. Uh, they'll also eat chicken dung and so on. If we didn't have flies, then then you know we'd, that wouldn't that dung wouldn't get recycled back in wouldn't get broken down and recycled back into the into the grass and and come back as future food for for herbivores to eat. So all of these things they're 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 doing something useful. We might find some of them ugly or vexatious or, or whatever, um, but nonetheless they're they're here. They're part of the natural world. Um, usually. Um, if they become a problem. So in the case of flies, um, the reason they become a problem is usually of our own doing. We create piles of manure or piles of household waste, so, which are ideal places for these things to breed, but they wouldn't naturally have, been, have reached anything like the populations that they do um, if it weren't for us creating huge amounts of, of horrible, rotting organic matter, which the flies say thank you very much and, and breed very fast in, and then they come back to annoy us as adults. Um, but it's kind of our own fault in the first place for, for making such a mess. Thank you. Now, you mention in that chapter that you feel that antibacterial soaps, wipes, etc., shouldn't even be in the home. Yeah, well, so um, we 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 do use uh, a, an awful lot of chemicals that we don't really need to use. Pe people are um, somewhat, ob or some people um, are somewhat obsessed by hygiene. They they think they need to sterilize. Um, work surfaces and their hands and door handles and so on. Um, they seem to have kind of forgotten the fact that, that we are, as, as organisms, we are covered in bacteria um, all the time. They, they are an integral, they are inside us, they are in all our tissues, they are inside our guts in vast numbers, they are all over our skin. Um, you are completely wasting your time by trying to sterilize your work surfaces. It's actually healthy for us to consume uh, many microorganisms. Um, 
And and so this strange obsession we have with with trying to kill and sterilise surfaces and so on um, is is actually completely bonkers. It doesn't make any sense at all. And of course, it's also potentially harmful for the environment if we're trying to sterilise everything and using lots of chemicals we don't need to. Um, it really is silly, and we kind of need to get a grip, to be honest. You then go on to discuss Jason, one of your PhD students, who was doing research on houseflies, and you wound up supervising his work, which actually meant reacquainting yourself with something that you referred to as battery farms, or as we refer to them here in the States, as factory farms. And this one particular factory farm happened to be one where they raised chickens. My question is in three parts. Can you explain the conditions the chickens were subjected to? And two, why a chemical application was not an appropriate solution? And three, how does this clearly demonstrate evolutionary change? Okay. So, um, yeah, battery farms, as we call them. It's a term used in Britain specifically for for chicken egg-producing um, uh, factories, and they are the most horrible places. Um, uh, so th they, when I was a teenager, I had a job um, collect picking eggs at the picking eggs, collecting the eggs produced by chickens in a, a small battery farm, and I, I, it, it lives me, with me to this day. That, I mean, I, I only spent a few weekends. I didn't do the job for long because it was horrendous. But you'd go in to these vast sheds, um, which were very dimly lit. You could just about see your way around. And the chickens lived in this dim lighting all, all their lives. Um, it was thick, choking dust. Um, thousands of animals um, kept in tiny cages. So the, the chickens were often kept two or three to a cage that was, was probably about a, a, a cubic foot in size, um, standing on a mesh floor, so they're nothing solid to sit on. Um, uh, and they'd spend their whole life stuck in this little cage. I, when I came in, I, I was the only thing they'd seen all day. You know, they'd just sit there all day long, trapped in their tiny cage, staring at the chickens in the opposite row. Um, and so, of course, when I came in, they'd all stare at me. And it's quite unnerving seeing 10,000 chickens all staring at you. But the poor things, you know, many of them had got no feathers. Um, the, 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 the environment was horrendous. Um, it stank, absolutely stank. Um, and, and uh, one of the problems that the chickens and the farmers face is that the, the, the huge amounts of chicken dung um, produced by all these animals, um, in, in a battery farm, it, um, it's just allowed to fall through the floor. There are slats in the floor uh, into a huge chamber underneath. Um, which fills up, and then every few months the farmer will, will get a, a, a digger and, and dig it out. Um, but it just make, creates the most perfect conditions for flies to breed. Uh, so on top of everything else in their miserable lives, these chickens are very often covered in flies, moving, you know, sitting on them, trying to feed on the corners of their eyes and around their beaks. And um, the, the whole thing is absolutely horrible. Um, now. The, um, the, the reason I, I came back to, to, to studying this or working in chicken farms many years later um, was because of this fly problem. And uh, I had a PhD student, who was Jason, who was working on um, how, to, how to control this fly problem in, in chicken farms. Now, you might think you'd just, the farmer would just get an insecticide and spray it. Um, but... Um, they simply don't work on houseflies. So houseflies have, have evolved resistance to, to every insecticide we have. Um, they, they breed very, very fast. Um, and so if, when a new insecticide comes along, um, you, you imagine you have a, a chicken house with a population of, let, let's say there are a million flies. There might, uh, might be many more than that, but let's go with a million. Um, you spray them all with your insecticide. Um, just by chance, one in, one, one in every 100,000 individuals, perhaps, might be resistant to that pesticide or have a little bit of resistance to that pesticide. So, so a small number of the flies don't die. Um, 
but you get rid of most of them, and, it, and your insecticide seems to have worked. The flies are all gone, apart from those few res partly resistant individuals. But of course, they breed incredibly quickly. The life cycle takes a fortnight. And so in just a few weeks, the flies are back, and you spray your pesticide again. But this time, there isn't just one in 10,000 that are resistant. Uh, most of the population is resistant because they're all, they've all, they're all the offspring of those few resistant flies. And so in just a few generations, you go from a, your insecticide working really well, killing all the pests, um, to, to you reach a point where it's not doing anything at all. And so the farmer then, he might apply more or he might up, uh, switch to a different chemical. But over time, they've become resistant to everything we can throw at them. Um, so, so killing them with chemicals is just not the way forward um, for, for house flies. And, and arguably, the, it, it's taking longer, but the similar things, have, of course, happened with many um, field uh, pest insects as well. Um, and, and it is a really neat example of, of how fast insects can evolve. Um, they have the advantage over uh, other organisms that they have enormous populations, that they, they can produce ridiculous numbers of offspring. Um, thousands of offspring per female um, and they can reach adulthood in, 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 a f in days in a couple of weeks um, so, so n if you exert any kind of selective pressure on them when, and the, the, the pressure when you spray them with a pesticide is enormous because you're killing most of them um, then you, pray, you, you basically select for the resistant flies and in no time at all uh, your pesticide doesn't work, which is which is why you know it's ob an obvious argument as to why we shouldn't rely entirely on on, on chemical controls uh, when we when we're trying to to manage pest problems. We need to look to the root of the problem. You know, we've, we've created these ideal conditions for flies to breed in. Perhaps we should think about changing that rather than just trying to kill them all by spraying ever more chemicals. Exactly, and then you later describe how there was a situation with cotton farmers. Can you just briefly describe what happened in that situation? This is a sort of classic tale that um, was taught to me when I was at university back in the 80s. This happened in the 1950s when insecticides first became um, readily available and cheaply available to, to farmers. Um, so, so things like uh, DDT, and various organophosphate insecticides. They would eventually, essentially were, they sprang out of the Second World War. That was when they were developed. And um, factories started manufacturing them cheaply. And it was a revolution in farming. Farmers suddenly, could, with one spray application, they could kill all the pests in their field, uh, be it cotton or, or, or whatever else. And so they stopped using traditional methods of controlling pests completely. There was no need for them anymore. They had these wonderful chemicals that they could spray on the fields and all the pests would be gone and they got beautiful crops. They got huge yields of crops. Um, uh, and, and everyone thought that this was fantastic. But of course, in the long term, uh, they were creating enormous problems for themselves. Um, it, it, it is never as simple as that. Um, uh, so what happened was that... Um, particularly in tropical and subtropical crops, things like cotton that are grown in warm climates where there are lots of insect pests, where insects can breed particularly rapidly, then just as with the houseflies, pest insects started to become resistant. Um, the pest insects tend to be the ones that can breed very fast, that have lots of offspring. Although to start with it seemed wonderful, five, ten years later, the pests started to reappear um, and when the farmers sprayed them, the sprays didn't work. Um, and not only that, um, but the farmers had, unfortunately, with these sprays, they'd killed all the natural enemies of the pests, the ladybirds, the, the lacewings, and the hoverflies, and so on, that might otherwise have, have consumed the pests and that did consume the pests in the past. Um, and without those natural enemies, and once they were resistant to the pesticide, the pests became much, much worse than they'd ever been before. Uh, and crops started to fail, so farmers would start applying mixtures of chemicals and applying more and more chemicals because the farmers had forgotten the traditional ways of managing uh, pests. And they'd got completely hooked on this idea of using chemicals. And so they put more and more chemicals on, mixtures of chemicals, and it reached a point where um, the farmers themselves were getting poisoned. 
Um, and, uh, and and the insects weren't, uh, at least not the ones they wanted to kill. Um, and, and eventually whole systems collapsed. Uh, many thousands of people were poisoned um, and the, the yields were lower than ever. And, and clearly something was badly wrong. And, and this utter reliance on chemicals was, abs- with hindsight, was absolute madness. And, and out of that was born a, a, a philosophy called Integrated Pest Management, IPM, which was, was one of going back to some of those traditional tools of, of pest management, using crop rotations and trap crops and encouraging natural enemies as a whole tool bag of, 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 of techniques that, uh, that, that have been used for centuries and, and that, uh, that are incorporated into IPM. And it, it essentially treats chemical applications as a last resort when everything else has, has failed. Um, and I think pretty much any scientist who, who's familiar with this story would, will agree that IPM is, is really the way forward, that we should, we should be treating chemicals as the very last thing we should be using to control pests. There may be instances where they're necessary, but treat them as a last resort, not the first resort, which unfortunately is largely what we actually still do. Thank you. It's evident after reading A Buzz in the Meadow that the journey that you're on has taken the direction that it has, especially in regards to the disappearance of our bees. Could you share with our readers what exactly was the point in which you started to publicly advocate for the protection of our bees? Uh, actually, my first interest in, in, in bees was, was nothing to do with, with conservation or their declines or anything else. It was um, I, I noticed a really interesting bit of behavior, and uh, it's, it's described in, 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 in A Sting in the Tail, um, my, my, my earlier book on bumblebees, um, and uh, I won't I won't bore you with all the details, but uh, essentially it turns out that, that bees, if you watch bees in a patch of flowers, they they don't land on every flower, and they 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 fly up very close, um, but they veer away at the last minute from many of the flowers that they could have landed on, and, and it turns out that what they're doing is they're sniffing the flowers for the faintest whiff of a previous bee visitor, and that tells them that the flower has recently been emptied and there's no point in landing. Um, Anyway, it took me five years to, to work that out, and uh, and I just I, I but but five years during which I became completely hooked on studying bees as just they're just so fascinating, so many things going on. They're so so intelligent for insects, um, and and it was much later actually that um, uh, I I'd been studying common bees that, that uh, you know I could find in 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 my back garden and, and in the university campus and so on. But when I read um, books, some of the older books about bumblebees, they would describe all these other species that I'd never seen. Um, so th- things like the short-haired bumblebee, um, which is uh, used to be found in England. Um, but actually, it went extinct in, in 1988, um, and, and so that's, of course, why I hadn't seen one. But there were other species that, that I knew hadn't gone extinct, but that had become really rare. And I started to think, well, what's happened to all these bees? Why, why you know, am I seeing only five or six species of bee when these books from 50 years ago suggest that I should be seeing a, a dozen or more species of bee? Um, and so, I, so I, I started trying to track down the, the surviving populations of the rare bees to study them and find out what had happened to them. And, and that, that was really how I got into, into bee conservation. And uh, ever since, I've been, I've been trying to, to, firstly, to work out how we might um, prevent, help those rare species and perhaps bring them back a little. Um, but perhaps more importantly, how, how we can make damn sure that we don't lose the common ones, because uh, if we do, then you know, we'll, be in, we'll be in big trouble. Thank you. I think the message from A Buzz in the Meadow is very clear that, number one, we are all truly connected, but also it's our responsibility to do the right thing by nature. And I think you've written about several different situations in which that's not always the case and some of the consequences for not having, I guess, that broad knowledge of all the endless possibilities. And after all, we are human, but still, it's something that we each are responsible for. 
Professor Goulson, could you share with our listeners your blog information and, once again, when the book will be available? Uh, yes, yeah, so A Buzz in the Meadow is out on the 28th of April in the United States. Um, if you want to find out more about me and what I'm up to in terms of research and my latest blog and so on, then um, my homepage at the University of Sussex is the place to head for. Um, so it's www.sussex.ac.uk. Forward slash life sci l i f e s c i forward slash Goulson Lab G O U L S O N L A B. Um, sorry, that's a bit long, but uh, the alternative is to just Google Goulson and B, and pretty quickly you'll track me down that way. <laughs> also, the link will be available in the companion article that will follow this interview, folks. Professor Goulson, thank you once again for coming on the show and talking about your magnificent work. I look forward to the next book and any book that's in the in the works that you can talk about. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, first of all, th- thanks as ever for coming on. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yes, so number three is about half written. Uh, Bee Quest, it's called. Love um, it. Uh, but I, I, I can't tell you any more at this point in time. Well, I look forward to reading that when that comes out as well. Uh, Thank you once again. And folks, please check out the book, A Buzz in the Meadow, The Natural History of a French Farm by Professor Dave Goulson, who also authored A Sing in the Tale, which is also a fabulous book to read. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.